views and opinions expressed on my story, Living with Lupus Podcast, represents each person's individual experience. By listening to this podcast or reading our blog, you agree not to use this podcast or blog as medical advice to treat any medical condition in either yourself or others. As always, consult your own physician for any medical issues that you may be having. My Story Living with Lupus podcast is officially trademarked, all rights reserved. Thank you for joining me for another episode of My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm your host, Susan Hendricks, and I'm so glad that you could join me on this Monday, November 22nd, 2021. This episode is all about lupus, more lupus, and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And the reason why I'm doing this podcast about lupus and more lupus and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I want you to truly understand that there exists more to this illness than what you see on social media. Um, There is different sides to lupus. And if I have to keep drilling it into your heads, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you about a new journey for me dealing with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma and lupus. So, you know what I want you to do. That's right, all the way from the United States to Lagos, Nigeria. Get ready to grab your cup of coffee, your cup of tea, and to my listeners late at night. You know I appreciate you, so come on, get ready, go ahead, go grab your favorite glass of wine, and lend me your ear, right here on My Story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I would like to thank you for joining me. We all know that lupus is not a one-size-fits-all type of illness. Let me ask you a question. When you were diagnosed with SLE, this is a question I'm asking those who have this illness. Did your rheumatologist sit down and explain to you this is the next step that we have to take and this is what is um how can i put this um This is what this illness is all about. Did they come just right out and tell you that no, there is no cure? And the only thing that we as a physician can do is treat the symptoms so that you will have some type of quality of life. And after that, did they go into the spill of we're going to start you off with drug A and you're going to have to take 
drug B and C and you're going to need um, multivitamins and you have to come in every three months um, so we can see how you're doing or did they just tell you okay you have lupus and here I'm going to start you off on this medication and I want to see you back in two to three months. And they just left you hanging. Just think about that. And if you are in the medical field and you just so happen to come across my podcast and you're a rheumatologist or a primary care physician or internal medicine. When you come across patients with a chronic illness such as lupus, why don't you be upfront with the patient? I know that you have to take into account um the i don't want to say fragile state but each patient is not the same some can handle being up front more than others i can understand you taking account of that but wouldn't it be best to be up front with those that can handle you being up front with and for those that you have to treat a little more delicately try doing it and explain to them that there is no cure for this illness that you're not going to feel your best every day that you will have to make readjustments within your life to deal with this illness. And that the majority of people will not understand what you're going through. Tell them that yes, eventually you will lose contact with people who used to call you each and every day Um, co-workers um, you'll lose in the long run because you won't be able to hold down a job. It's not because you're lazy. It's because that the illness may affect you in a way where you can no longer work. Why is it that You don't sit down with the patient along with a significant other, a relative, or or an adult child of theirs and say, hey, this is what um, she or he has. The road is not going to be easy for them. It's all about you understanding what they go through. Here is some reference material for you to look over. And if you should have any questions regarding this, I'm available for you to ask. And if I don't get back with you in the same day, I will get back with you before the week is out. Wouldn't that be more feasible than to just leave individuals hanging? You know, I often wondered about that. You know, you have some doctors that will take the time and explain to the patient what to expect, what is going on. And then you have other doctors that treat patients like an assembly line. 
you're in, you're out. And maybe that's due to the fact that you have these for-profit companies that either um, has bought out a medical practice or a health facility. So you have to run it their way or it's the highway for the physician. But what about that? I'm going to tell you that, and I've said this in my podcast on November the 6th, that individuals with systemic lupus erythematosus is at a higher risk of developing cancer. That's right. We know that lupus attacks, um, SLE attacks, the internal organs, the tissue, and the cells. I've been recently diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Am I surprised? No, because I knew what was down the line um, when it came to this disease. And it's not that I'm a know-it-all, but um, it's due to my background. It is due to the simple fact that I believe in research, 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 research. And I'm not going to um, take anybody's word for granted. Just like if you are hesitant in Believing what I'm saying, I am expecting you to do the research. And you should do the research and say, hey, she was right. So maybe I need to to, um, pay closer attention um, when um, someone is trying to tell me what's going on. And, you know, I'm not saying that everyone will um, contract, um, if that is the right word that I'm using for this, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Am I concerned? No. No. When, When I was told Um, I listened to what the doctor was saying, but I was rebuking it all along. When he said, Susan, you have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I said to myself, by his stripes, I am healed. So I was taking everything in, but I was doing my little thing internally. Now, when it comes to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, we must understand this lupus, better known as SLV, and lymphomas or lymphoma, studies have shown that lupus patients have an increased risk of developing both Hodgkin's and non Hodgkin's lymphoma. Lupus and lymphoma are believed to be related because of the overstimulation of B cells is coupled with the defects in the immune system 
in lupus patients. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a type of cancer that begins in your lymphatic system. I did a podcast on the lymphatic system and brought this information up to you. Now, The lymphatic system is a part of the body's germ-fighting immune system. Now, in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, white blood cells called lymphocytes grow abnormally and can form overgrowths, better known as tumors throughout the body. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a general category of lymphoma. Now, there exist many subtypes that fall in this category. Diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, are among the most common subtypes. The other general category of lymphoma is Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, advances in the disease and treatment of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma has helped improve the prognosis for people with this disease. Now, I have not been feeling well for about, I should say, about maybe two to three months. Started out with abdominal pain, abdominal swelling, lymph nodes um, infected, and um, the lymph nodes in my neck Um, I'm having trouble there, along with neck swelling. Now, I go back to the specialist next week, next Thursday. Um, I've experienced chest pain. My fatigue has been persistent. I've had fevers night sweats, and unexplained weight loss. Now, um, the causes, in most instances, doctors don't know what causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. It begins when your body produces too many abnormal lymphocytes, which are a type of white blood cells, as stated earlier. Um, Normally, lymphocytes go through a predictable life cycle. Old lymphocytes die, and your body creates new ones to replace them in non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Your lymphocytes don't die and your body keeps creating new ones. This oversupply of lymphocytes crowds into your lymph nodes, causing them to swell. Stay with me. When we return, you'll hear more. In regards to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Thank you for rejoining me here at My Story Living with Lupus podcast. We're talking about... SLE and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, 
And if you're just tuning in, I recently was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now we're going to complete um, our conversation. We're going to talk about B cells and T cells. Now, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma most often begins in the B cells. Now, B cells are a type of lymphocyte that fights infection by producing antibodies to neutralize foreign invaders. Most non-Hodgkin's lymphoma arises from B cells. Subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that involve B cells include diffused large B cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, mantle cell lymphoma, and Burke lymphoma. T cells are a type of lymphocyte that's involved in killing foreign invaders directly. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma occurs much less often in T cells. Subtypes of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma that involve T cells include peripheral T-cell lymphoma and cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. Whether that your non-Hodgkin's lymphoma arises from your B-cells or T-cells, it helps to determine your treatment options. Now, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma generally involves the presence of cancerous lymphocytes in your lymph nodes, but the disease can also spread to other parts of the lymphatic system. These include the lymphatic vessels, tonsils, adenoids, spleen, thymus, and bone marrow. Occasionally, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma involves organs outside of your lymphatic system. Now, when it comes to risk factors, most people diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma don't have any obvious risk factors. And many people who have risk factors for the disease never develop it. Some factors that may increase the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma includes medications that suppress your immune system, if you had an organ transplant and take medications that control your immune system, you might have an increased risk of Hodgkin's lymphoma. Infections with certain viruses and bacteria. Certain viral and bacterial infections appear to increase the risk of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Viruses linked to this type of cancer include HIV and Epstein-Barr infection. Bacteria linked to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma include the ulcer causing pylori. That's bacteria in the gut. Chemicals play a role in this also. 
certain chemicals, such as those used to kill insects and weeds, may increase your risk of developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. More research is needed to understand the possible link between pesticides and the development of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Now, when it comes to your age, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma can occur at any age, but the risk increases with age. It's most common in people 60 or over. So, I have an appointment next Thursday to see the specialist regarding some swollen lymph nodes again. Um, And also, um, I have to see my oncologist. I informed my family of the diagnosis that was given to me. And um, they took it pretty well. I am not concerned at this point. I just would love to feel much better than what I do right now. Um, With everything that is going on with my body, um, to be honest with you, and you rarely hear me make this statement. I just want to feel better. Um, The fatigue is really getting on my nerves. Um, I can have a burst of energy in the morning and then all of a sudden it doesn't last long. It's like I'm crashing right now. I'm not feeling my best. Um, I know that my brother asked me um, was I going to take radiation chemo? And I told him no. if, If there is a pill to take I would Um, prefer to take that form of treatment before we um, talk about doing any radiation therapy. But I know that um, I just don't feel good. I'm not going to lie. My neck is swollen. And it... um, It is what it is. Um, Like I said, when they told me the diagnosis, I stated by his stripes, I am healed. If you experience any of the symptoms that was um, stated in this podcast, go get checked out. Go get it checked out. Uh, I ask for your continued prayers, um, would be much appreciated, and um, I will keep you informed, I promise, to do another podcast next week after I see the specialist to inform you what is what, but please note that Lupus is not a one-size-fits-all type of illness. And if I have to keep drilling it in your head, that's what I will do. Yes, there needs to be a cure for this illness instead of pumping us up with 
drugs. And sometimes I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Sometimes the drugs that are prescribed does the body more harm than good. Prime example was for me being on hydroxychloroquine for the lupus. The doctor said it caused my body more harm than good. So that's new on my end, but I want you to stick with me. And when we return, we'll talk about more lupus. So stay with me. New research shows top barriers to lupus care and diagnosis, including delayed access to specialists and high increase health care costs. Findings from a new study of more than 1,300 people with lupus show that several barriers to care can impact a lupus diagnosis. The study conducted by the Lupus Foundation of America um, was presented recently at the 2021 Lupus 21st Century Conference. Respondents face many healthcare challenges from the time they first saw a doctor for their symptoms. Healthcare related challenges associated with delayed diagnosis include overall more than half, 51%, reported long wait times before seeing a specialist. Those with delayed diagnosis, five or more years reported this problem in higher numbers than those who were diagnosed in less than a year. Almost a third, which is 31% of all respondents, reported that out-of-pocket costs were too high. Overall, 30% of all respondents noted there were not enough doctors nearby to treat lupus. 32% with a delayed diagnosis reported this, while 25% of those diagnosed in less than a year did the same. Other barriers associated with delayed lupus diagnosis and care included insurance not covering the cost of needed services and long wait times to receive an appointment with a primary care provider. Now, we that have been diagnosed with lupus has been saying this for the longest regarding the insurance, regarding the long wait time just to see a specialist trying to get diagnosed for this illness. Now, we know that lupus is called the great imitator, that it imitates so many other conditions, and that's the reason why it takes so long for some of us to be diagnosed. Now, to find a good doctor for some may have to travel, um, 
this is just an example, maybe 20 to 25 miles. Now, some people I know that live in the city of Detroit will travel all the way up to Ann Arbor to go to the University of Michigan to get care because they feel that the doctors um, within the city really don't care about patients who have lupus. Um, I have talked to some that have felt that the doctor said, well, since it's state, state, not the doctors, but the individual state, that since there's no cure for lupus, you know, um, what's the point in seeing patients at all with the um, illness? But could it be that since there exist so many of us with this illness that um, you may come across some doctors who um, don't like to say that they don't know. Doctors who have an ego or I have to refer you out to someone else, they don't take the patient's care into consideration over their egos. Could that be the, the case? Well, other barriers associated with delayed lupus diagnosis and care, like I said, included the insurance portion. Now, if you have lupus, I know this um, for a fact, you have lupus and um, just say you were previously working and you had to quit your job due to your health. So that means there goes your health insurance. So you apply for state coverage just so you can see a physician. And under the state covered insurance, um, it will not cover needed services for patients with a chronic illness such as lupus, or they will put you in a HMO. And before you can see a specialist, you have to go to a doctor that you know nothing about. You have to leave your doctor, your primary care physician, who you are comfortable with, to go to a doctor that you know nothing about just to see, get a referral to see a rheumatologist. People with lupus need access to care. They need to receive an accurate diagnosis and improve health outcomes. You know, in over 60 years, um, there still is no cure. So in my mind, that's telling me we're at the bottom of the totem pole. This study also found that many respondents reported they were misdiagnosed, including with anxiety, depression, or fibromyalgia before their lupus diagnosis. Now we know that fibromyalgia, depression, and anxiety is an underlying condition which is caused by the, um, the lupus. Almost 22% of the respondents were told nothing was wrong with them. As I stated before, lupus can be difficult to diagnose due to its diverse symptoms and impact on each individual. That's why I've always said lupus is not a one-size-fits-all illness. However, there is a lot that the medical community 
could do to help ensure an accurate lupus diagnosis and access to care. The study helps further identify these key barriers to lupus diagnosis and care, which is important to better understand how to overcome these barriers. Um, come on, we all know that there needs to be more um, specialty physicians such as rheumatologists to mentor other doctors on what to look for with patients who are experiencing the symptoms that lupus patients experience. Healthcare providers basically need to be educated. They need to hold a course to educate those in the medical field regarding individuals with lupus. Stick with me and I'll be talking about being thankful for what you have. Being thankful helps each and every one of us to think more about other people's feelings. This, my friend, is called empathy. Being able to see things from another person's view. Being thankful also helps each and every one of us get through life's tough times because you can easily call to mind all of the good things in your life. Acknowledging the good that you already have in your life is the foundation for all abundance. Susan Hendricks, your host for my story, Living with Lupus Podcast. I'm wishing you and your family a most thankful and blessed Thanksgiving. I'll see you next week for another episode.